All right, you guys can hear me? Yep. All right, so my name is Chris, and I'm going to talk about my experience. Oh, is this the clicker? Adam? Yeah. I assume the big green button means go forward. <laughs> that was the other green one. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, my experience uh, in working with uh, a team uh, to build an out-of-order core uh, in industry. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk about what I thought Verilog is bad at, uh, and then kind of talk about what I thought Chisel is good at. Um, I'll kind of bounce around a few issues that we encountered and how we solved those issues, uh, and then kind of maybe end with a broader, some of the obstacles that um, make adopting Chisel hard in industry, and then I'll just have a grab bag of uh, feature wish lists for Adam to add to his next uh, talk. Um, so as just a summary, um, I think a small team, uh, or you only need kind of a small team to build something pretty complicated, uh, and, and that you can do that very successfully. Um, it was nice to see that RTL designers can actually, I think, learn Chisel pretty quickly uh, to be productive. We had people within a week or two already committing to the repository. The other cool thing that I think we've seen over and over again is you can actually have software people start to write RTL code uh, with Chisel. Um, I was interested to find out all the sorts of Verilog created time sinks that exist, and Chisel just kind of sidesteps a lot of them. Um, there are, of course, some missing features that would be nice to have. Um, being able to have a parameterizable design, being able to change the design very quickly based on feedback, uh, I thought was a really huge win. Um, unfortunately, we're at least making design verification not easier. I don't know exactly what the delta is on harder, uh, but there's definitely a strong story there to try and, you know, if we want to really get uh, chisel adoption, if we can figure out the DV story, that'd be great. And also, I'm going to complain quite a bit about chisel's monolithic build um, that adds quite a bit of pain to the back end uh, as you get to the very end of a project. Um, but there are some stuff that gets easier, like the electrical um, equivalence checking and the um, uh, clock domain crossing type stuff. Um, and just to uh, set kind of the, the scope of this, we were building a, you know, a, a superscalar out of order core. This is all in chisel in terms of the core up to the L1 caches. Uh, this is fully synthesizable, just using off the shelf SRAM, so we weren't you know, it's not hard to embed custom stuff into your design, but we didn't have to do that um, via black boxes. Uh, and to accelerate this, we were starting from the open source boom in rocket ship. And in our case, we were uh, fixing a lot of critical paths to punch up the frequency. We were adding a lot of performance features, predictors, prefetchers uh, to punch up the IPC, um, and then added quite a bit of post-silicon debug stuff for traces, um, et cetera. So this is, um, you know, quite a bit of work that was added on top of this. And pretty happy to say that I think we, we delivered something that, that works and hit the targets that we were claiming that we would at the beginning. Um, so this is my view of Chisel history. It's, I apologize, not a Star Wars scroll. Um, and maybe this is wrong, and unfortunately there's people in the room that can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but I joined Berkeley in 2009, and there were two really big RTL projects going on at the time. One was um, this um, Ramp Gold FPGA machine, where it was a split timing functional model all in the FPGA, simulating 64 Spark cores, uh, and this would run at megahertz for the target um, cycle. Uh, so this is really, you could run some really impressive stuff. And then the other one was this uh, studying this new vector thread architecture. And obviously the best way to evaluate that is to build it, but you can't just build one, you have to build all of your competition. So that was, they built a scalar core, a multi-threaded core, a traditional vector core, a GPU like SMT core, then the vector core, vector thread core, but you couldn't just build those. You had to, you know, change out the number of lanes, the number of threads, the register file size, the mix of functional units. Um, so that was pretty ambitious, and it actually did happen. Whoops, uh, going backwards. So you can actually, you know, read about it. Um, and we were told at the time that RTL was easy, so we allocated six weeks to that project. Um, there was a little bit of pain and suffering. Uh, it did get done eventually after a little bit of schedule slip. Uh, and as I remember, the three main problems of this was, one, the FPGA tools were really terrible at things like System Verilog. Really, just general System Verilog support was awful 10 years ago. And I don't know if the story's really got any better. Um, uh, so that's unfortunate that you can't really be productive with all the cool stuff in System Verilog. The other problem was is that when you're trying to describe, uh, you know, parameterizing the lanes, parameterizing the latencies, the function units, uh, you really need some sort of good metaprogramming generator language to describe your hardware that you're trying to, you know, explore design space with. Uh, and the other thing that I remember is you get everything working in RTL simulation, which is hard enough, 
And then you'd run at the gate level and nothing works. And there's no real good reason for that, other than just the language is garbage. Um, so of course, the solution to this is just build a new language, obviously, and add things like great support for object-oriented programming and functional programming, have um, um, bulk connects of your IOs and your structs. Um, but the other key thing that we kind of take for granted now with Chisel is it generates a very valid, synthesizable, bulletproof subset of Verilog. Uh, so that way, if it works on one simulator, it's going to give you basically the same answer on any other simulator. And if it can go to FPGA, it's going to go to the FPGA tools. Uh, and this ends up being a real time saver that if you're handwriting the Verilog, um, you know, you may hit into. And so I think for these things that we were trying to do, I think Chisel's a really great success at writing RTL. Um, to talk about uh, more specifically some of the things that I saw with Verilog development is one is just you need a really good style guide to not hurt yourself with Verilog. Uh, I think I heard you know, something like you only use 5% of the language if you're trying to actually tape out a design, and that's horrifying. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not just only 5%, but it's such a complicated thing that the tools don't implement everything, or they disagree on how to implement something, how to do like promotions of bitwidths or something. Um, so you have to have a good style guide. But if, for example, you're a startup, you're pulling engineers from multiple companies, they're going to come with their own style guide built in. And you may not learn that you made a bad decision until you get to place in route 12 months later. Um, the other thing is that if you write C code and you do something stupid, you don't initialize, or you, you know, use the wrong type, you may get a, a warning, which is great. Unfortunately, for Verilog, you have to pay to get warnings. Uh, and they call this the Lint tool. And not all companies can afford Lint for the whole project. And so when you finally can pay for Lint and you turn it on, you get tens and tens of thousands of errors. And it'd be nice if Lint was just so bad you could ignore those and move on with your day. Uh, but they're actually like, you know, 99.99% useless, but there's that last remaining percent that you actually need to go and look through. Um, and certainly Chisel will generate lint errors as well, but they're also stylized that you can just pick out the exact one that you wanted. Um, the other thing that took a lot of time was clock domain crossing efforts. And you have to analyze all of the crossings of all the wires to see if you hook something up wrong. And it's a really clever tool. It does find errors, but it's also a very painful manual effort, and the tool is very hacky, and it thinks things are wrong that aren't wrong again. It's these false positives that are really killing the project. Um, and then, like I said, the language semantics are really confusing that you could have engineers not agree on the outcome of something, and they could both be right. Um, to my horror, I figured out that you could, have, you could have a waveform, and you could look at the source code, and there's a separate file that you can't find that actually tells you what the x-propagation rules are for your particular simulation. Um, and I didn't know that you could change X prop rules. That was cool to learn. Um, so Chisel's approach here is just only you know, codify the Verilog style in the Verilog emitter, only generate something that's going to synthesize and it's going to work well with any tool. Um, and although it's very structural and kind of painful like reading assembly, everything's single assignment, everything's two operands, so it's actually not the hardest thing in the world to follow through and understand what the Verilog is actually going to do. Um, and because we're doing things in Chisel, you can actually catch a lot of these errors at the Chisel level before they ever make it to the Verilog. Um, although I do, as a wish list item, I would like a Chisel linter, because there are some patterns and some mistakes. You know, things like, say, that uh, Chisel 2 example. If you had a linter, maybe you could help catch uh, things like that. Um, so here's just kind of a grab bag of, of things that we, we saw and had to do. So one was how to wire up trace signals. So you have designers working on their modules, and they want to be able to get a waveform in after they've gone to silicon. Uh, and so they have to somehow get from inside some subunit that's in a hierarchy out to some external debug unit. And the way that we did this is we used uh, the Born utils, uh, I believe implemented and contributed by Skylar at IBM, to just magically annotate uh, a source of a signal and then sync it to some place. And that was actually pretty awesome that you could just say, here's signals I care about, and then just magically punch it through compiler transforms to get it over here. Um, now, there was a challenge, which is that you have multiple cores in your project, and you want um, Chisel to see that these are all the same core, that they can do deduplication, so you tell your physical design team, only give me one core, and then we'll stamp it. So in our case, we could only punch out to the very edge of the boundary, so that way 
each of these cores would look identical. If we had tried to punch all the way out, uh, the dedupe pass would have failed. Um, a big problem that we had to hack around was how to actually deal with in, uh, industry RAMs. And we did this like two years ago. So maybe Berkeley or Sci-5 has figured this out. Uh, if you've had, please write a cookbook or a wiki blog post on this, because uh, we didn't know how to do this at the time. But basically, Chisel has an SRAM behavior model, you know, reads and write ports. The real industry SRAM has a lot of weird stuff like built-in self-test and voltage guidance and sleep modes, and my chisel cannot do a sleep mode. So um, the problem is, is that, one, we had to essentially black box the SRAM so we could not rely on chisel's writer, reader type passes. So that way we could get access to the extra modes that we needed. But the other problem is that you have to then get those signals to some external controller. So in our case, you know, black box magic and then born utils to punch it to where we wanted it to be. But it would be nice if, you know, A, there's a cookbook or, you know, some sort of um, good examples to look at on how to do this kind of lowering. Maybe if there's a way to be able to take an existing behavior model but extend the API to add some new signals that you can black box. Uh, and also, I don't know if there's maybe a better way to kind of punch out to some SRAM controller elsewhere in the hierarchy. Um, Let's see, I think in the interest of time, I'll keep moving on. Um, XProp was a little bit of fun. The two-port uh, chisel module actually will not model contention, which I learned the hard way late in the project. The fun thing about branch predictors is that no matter what you do, they work anyways. Um, so the problem is that XProp doesn't really help you. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, we also, oh, uh, we also had to change out um, the round robin arbiter in the chisel library because that um, initializes its state to a don't care, which admittedly is a don't care. I don't care which y you start with. But unfortunately, for simulations that are reproducible that don't have x's, we had to change that out. Um, this is an example where I would love to have a chisel linter. So if you do like a win a plus 1 over b, if a and b are the same width, um, then a plus 1 stays the same width as a. So that way, this will actually not trigger if they're at their max values. Uh, and this, again, happened to be a bug in predictors, so everything seemed to work, except performance wasn't great. Um, and I think we may have caught that with the Verilog linter, actually. But it'd be, so what we did is we just said, okay, to our style guide, when we do a code review, look for any plus ones in the code base. Uh, and that was pretty effective, because it shows up almost nowhere. Uh, but it would be kind of cool if Lint could actually say something like, hey, you're doing this, you probably need to actually use the expanding ad. Um, fertile passes are an amazing value out of the Chisel ecosystem. Unfortunately, it's actually kind of hard to think of good uses of it for an industry core. Um, you know, like we're not auto-inserting scan chains or anything. Uh, we only were really using born utils and we were using flattening passes. Because the back-end team, they can flatten, but then everything gets a mess. So they would prefer if Chisel flattens and then you have Verilog that's pre-flattened. It makes doing ECOs easier. Um, so I asked the team what they thought. And um, some are super excited, like endless possibilities, or this is actually pretty intellectually exciting compared to Verilog. Um, others, you know, were like, eh, I prefer Verilog. Um, and then another complaint was depending upon the style that you write your code, if you write like a very functional generator style, maybe you might have a hard time reasoning about timing for some stuff. Um, the physical design team mostly just kind of saw Verilog coming by. Um, but I don't think that they were happy, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, about these kind of monolithic drops, uh, where instead of doing one little small change, you're basically giving them a whole new uh, Verilog thing. And then DV, um, they're very coverage metrics focused, so there's a lot of issues with Chisel there. Um, in particular, they want to see, are we, you know, functional coverage things, is the line coverage good, the toggle coverage, so that way we know that the design has mostly been tested and now it's ready to ship. Um, and so we can certainly, in Chisel, add functional coverage points. The designer says, please cover these and use a black box. Um, but other things like line coverage, Chisel just kind of generates a straight line of Verilog, so every line is covered. Uh, so they weren't happy to see 100%. I, I was surprised by that. Um, and then the other issue is that uh, any sort of unsynthesized logic, like say to drive an assertion, will now pollute your, your coverage metrics. So I know that there's some really fancy stuff at Sci-5 where you try to have a pass that can pull out your assertions into a separate file and use cross-module references. Uh, that would be great if that could be made ironproof and open-sourced, because that's the kind of thing that, that DV really, you know, would really kind of like. 
Um, and also, DV doesn't like that they can't understand design intent. I keep telling them, just look at the chisel code. They don't like that answer. Um, I don't know why. It's not that hard to read. It's easier to read. But there's things like, for example, you'll never know, you'll never know that there's an FSM in your chisel code if you look at the Verilog output. Um, so in terms of, the, I think, the big obstacle to industry adoption, you know, DV is hard, but it's maybe some small delta harder. The back end part's a little scary. Uh, the physical design team has to do a lot of work. They have to take the Verilog, synthesize it, place and route it, floor plan it. They have to integrate hard macros from other teams, fix the ERC errors, fix the routing and congestions, be able to deliver the clock. They now have to add in design for tests and other sorts of weird stuff later in the project. And that can take weeks or months to do that iteration. Um, and projects will always require late fixes. Maybe it's a performance bug. Uh, maybe it's that plus one issue or something. Um, and RTL always wants to keep making the design better. Um, and so the solution is to kind of slowly crystallize or slowly freeze the design block by block and you know, push the RTL guys into a smaller and smaller corner that they can actually still touch. Um, you know, unfortunately, Chisel's monolithic compile, compilation system kind of really complicates this, it's especially if you're, say, using diplomacy on top of this with Rocketship. You know, you're kicking in this whole JVM, you're firing up Java, maybe you're doing a diplomacy and parameter injection, so now you're renegotiating all of your parameters. Um, you then have to do um, optimizations across modules, you're doing dead code elimination, so maybe IOs will disappear on another module because I changed something, or maybe I'll add an assert that'll add more things over there. Um, if you're generating multiple projects and stitching them together, you'll all have the same chisel names like Q1, Q2 across projects. So it becomes very hard to just fix a single wire and only have kind of that code that is actually affected change to hand to the, to the verification team, or sorry, to the back end team. Um, so it would be good to maybe have some sort of story about how to maybe, you know, first of all, have incremental compilation but also be able to say, hey, I only want to change this piece or this piece. Can you, you know, maybe not change other pieces or at least verify that those pieces don't actually change? Um, so maybe a concrete example is, you know, I ask a designer, you know, what, would it, what, what are your issues with Chisel? And so the question is, if Chisel doesn't quite give you what you want, how do I actually change Chisel to get what I want? And if I do make that change, particularly late in a project, how do I make sure I didn't change everything else? So you may have a critical path in some module and the solution is actually that the Verilog emitter needs to be changed. Um, and maybe that's not too hard to do, but then if I rerun my project, I've now changed the Verilog emitter, and now some other critical path in some other project gets undone. And I understand that you can maybe have a path that only, or a path that only works on a module, but you know, then do we end up with a nightmare of, you know, for module foo, Verilog emitter version 2.3, and then when the project is over, for the next project, you have to refigure out all these, these you know, I don't know what the solution is. I'm just up here complaining. Uh, but these are some of the issues that, you know, you, you deal with when, when talking to your back-end teams. And I think that there's an unfortunate tension between trying to make these, you know, wide, sweeping, agile changes to the code base, but then as you enter the later project, you kind of have to make tiny scalpel incisions, and you're really trying to avoid re-kicking off that DVPD waterfall. That's just kind of unavoidable. Um, so I think I'll end with kind of our, our wish list of items, just a few of them. You know, we love using Verity. Uh, it's great to bounce around and see exactly where um, something in the waveform is in your Verilog code, but it'd be also, and, and also the value of the Verilog signal, but it'd also be kind of cool if it could figure out where that um, Verilog line of code actually is in the chisel, maybe the chisel value. Um, namespaces would be a really great thing. Um, so if you're doing like an engineering change order where you need to like just patch in a little thing, It'd be nice to be able to say, here's a namespace for my patch, and then only generate new Verilog with that name annotated so I know exactly which signals in the Verilog changed. Um, also, we were actually stitching together different chisel projects, so the fact that they all had the same names was a bit of a problem. You can fix it with the said script, but it'd be nice if there was a better way. Um, and, um, you know, some people I talk to, they have a lot of C and C++ utility collateral that they connect into their RTL. And Chisel is kind of, it's an engineering problem, but it's a bit of a pain to try to connect to something that's not Java world. So it'd be great to have that path. And I was told once upon a time that people wouldn't touch Verilog until they formally proved that the Verilog matched the netlist. You know, obviously we're doing sign off on Verilog, so it's less of a problem. But it'd be nice if there was more formal proofs to give more confidence on all these, say, fertile passes, you know, Chisel passes and stuff. Um, 
And with that, you know, I just want to conclude and say, you know, really there's no showstoppers. Worst case, you can black box your way out of any problems. Um, it was really nice to be able to change IOs, add new signals, punch wires around, you know, really pretty quickly. And it was nice that our design was very later friendly. So, um, you know, for our out of order core with level one caches, uh, you know, chisel compile time was two minutes, fertile compile time was 10 minutes. Unfortunately, Verilator was like 30 or 40, but once you did that, you could now put this on AWS and run it two kilohertz. Uh, and um, other style guides may not let you run on Verilator. Um, and then there's a lot of other things that were just a lot easier. Um, and if nothing else, chisel brings kind of a more software mentality to RTL, and uh, that ended up, I think, um, helping make the team a lot more productive. Um, thanks.